Hello everybody, this is Dan Bigman. I am your GPR professor from LearnGPR.com. Today I'm coming at you with a video. It's something a lot of people ask me about. Um, how do you write a report or you know, what should a report look like, a GPR report? I've seen and reviewed lots of GPR reports and they range in quality from excellent, almost overdone, um, but still great, uh, to horrible and should not be given to a customer um, and sometimes it's not their fault. They just don't know any better. Nobody ever taught them how to write a report. Um, this goes for not just GPR, but a lot of kind of technical report writing. Um, but when I got all these requests, you know, I decided to put in a section in our new book, GPR Basics, about report writing. And so in uh, one of our chapters, we literally go into, you know, how do you, how do you write a report, okay? And, and um, after you've documented what you've done, how do you present that, right? And so a structure of a GPR report, what should be in there? Okay, what are the different sections that should be in a GPR report? And I give you five sections that are absolutely necessary in any GPR report. I'll go over what those sections are now. So, structure of a GPR report, okay? Structure of a GPR report. There are five sections that have to be in there. Even if you don't have headings, for the sections, here's the flow of what your report should look like, and here are the things that should be in each of these sections, okay? So number one is an introduction, okay? Introduction is the first section of the report. Look, I've done reports that use these, this organization that are one page, and I've used the same exact organization for reports that are 40 pages. So that's a big difference. Even my one pagers are gonna follow the structure that I lay out for you right now, okay? This is the structure. Number one, introduction. You're probably saying to yourself, well, of course, an introduction would come first, duh. Well, what is in your introduction? What's in your introduction? Think to yourself, okay? Put in a comment below, okay? What do you put in an introduction? I'm gonna tell you what I put in the introduction there's one thing that goes in every introduction, and it's the most important thing. And that is your scope of work, okay? Your scope of work. If it's a research report, right, if it's, if it's your academia, what goes into your introduction? It's your research question. Same, okay? Basically, it's the same. For commercial, it's your scope of work. What, was, what were you contracted out to do? Exactly what were you contracted out to do, okay? We were contracted out to cover approximately this amount of space at this you know, uh, uh, resolution uh, to find targets that were potentially this deep. You know, that is exactly what goes in there. Our scope of work, uh, you know, evaluate the presence or absence of unmarked burials in an area approximately you know, 20 meters by 40 meters rectangular. Well, I don't know what it is, what your scope of work is, but Whatever the scope of work was in your contract, I, you should potentially want to take that thing word for word and stick it as the first or second sentence in your introduction. Why is this so important when you read? Okay, why is this so important, the scope of work? The rest of your report documents that you've satisfied this scope of work. Okay, that you've satisfied this scope of work. So how can the reader or your customer know by the end of the report that you've actually accomplished it? Well, they need to know what you were supposed to do. So you put what the scope of work is in the first sentence or two of your entire report, that is your introduction, and then the rest of the report rolls back up to this, showing that you have satisfied it, okay? Very, very important. What else can go in an introduction? What else can go in is setting, environmental conditions, background, right? how the project even came about, uh, you know, okay, area 20 meters by 40 meters to, you know, evaluate the presence or absence of unmarked burials, right? Why? Because they're going to be doing refurbishment of this historic cemetery, and before they start uh, um, breaking down a wall and reconstructing it, they want to make sure that they don't hit any graves, right? Something like that. They have their 100th anniversary, and they're going to do the reconstruction, and it's going to start in 2019. They want to get this uh, you know, work done prior to that, whatever it is. So that can go in the introduction as well. Background, setting, environmental conditions, and so forth. Um, can go in the introduction. You could give 
a sentence about your results in the introduction, but most importantly, scope of work. Okay, what is section number two? So now you've evaluated, you've told the reader what you were supposed to do. Okay, section two is going to be methods. This is where you give background to the techniques that you're actually using, like you know, the science behind it. Again, this is true in a one pager as well. So the science doesn't have to be very technical, it doesn't have to be over people's heads. It can be very simple, okay? And it could be somewhat boilerplate, I hate to say it, but it could be somewhat boilerplate where you basically describe in a paragraph or two or three, or if it's a long report, two or three pages or four pages uh, about the technique. So how does GPR work? You know, the signal comes out, what are you actually recording? What does GPR do? What are its limitations? And then you might want to put in, and I like to do this, is a paragraph that's specific to the, to the project. Um, one or two paragraphs specific to the project. So you basically might want to put, okay, you know, right, it's a 20 by 40 meter area. We're trying to evaluate presence or absence of unmarked graves. I go into what GPR does. Then I go into, um, GPR is a very popular technique used to identify unmarked graves because, bop, bop, bop. So it's specific to the application. In this area, I also uh, uh, rain citations down on them um, to show the validity of the technique, okay? And so the value of presence or absence of unmarked graves in historic cemeteries is a very popular technique. Uh, So-and-so researcher showed that, you know, what metal coffins look like. So-and-so researcher showed what intact graves look like. So-and-so researcher showed uh, um, what void spaces look like from deteriorating graves that haven't slumped in. Um, you know, and a whole variety of other things, okay? It's been used across the world, citation, 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 from a bunch of different examples from around the globe, okay? Um, so that's what methods is. It describes, okay, GPR. I also like to put in this section, uh, you know, what the expected responses are, right? So the expected responses for GPR when locating graves are this, 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 and this, and then I might put something specific to their project site where I say, on your project site, it was plowed. And so we can't use variation in the surface reflection to evaluate uh, disturbance. That's going to limit our ability to perform. It's still going to be probably successful because you're in sandy soils and the graves are within the top, you know, uh, four to six feet. And we expect to be able to see the bottom of the graves. But one limitation is going to be that it was plowed. And so it's going to be hard to tell the difference between the grave shaft and the plowed soil because they're all unconsolidated. Um, so it's one way that you could locate graves that we can't use on your site. So that's what I, what I try to do here. Number three is um, data collection parameters. Okay, data collection parameters. So here's where I basically outline the strategy. Okay. I may say exactly what system I use. I might say that up here, but I might say it down here, okay? The exact system you use. How you went about doing it, um, you know, for uh, uh, locating graves, you might say, uh, because graves are so small and the area was sufficiently open without uh, um, uh, bushes or trees as obstacles, we laid out a grid that was 20 meters by 40 meters, uh, and we collected data uh, um, in a zigzag fashion and our transect spacing was every half a meter or every, you know, 30 centimeters, you know, whatever it is. Um, and our step rate was this and our frequency was this. So that's all the stuff that goes into here. Okay. That's one example, right, of, of how you might want to lay it out in the report. Let's say you're doing concrete scanning. Here's how you might, might, might do it. We used a, an antenna manufactured by XYZ manufacturer. It has a frequency of 2,700 uh, megahertz, which is a sufficient frequency to identify very small targets. Um, we collected 16 two foot by two foot grids across the site, or we investigated 16 two foot by two foot areas in, uh, you know, across the site. We pushed the antenna across each two foot by two foot area in perpendicular directions to make sure that we didn't alienate rebar or other conduit or anything like that going in a specific direction. Um, and we pushed you know, our, our GPR across this two foot by two foot space every four inches to get su sufficient resolution uh, um, you know, to make determinations on any 
uh, uh, reinforcements within the area. I don't know, something like that, okay? Really specific. 16 of these two foot by two foots went two different directions, perpendicular directions, so we didn't alienate targets. We used a 2700 megahertz antenna, and we pushed the EPR every four inches. You know, it's pretty specific. And then give a photo. Give a photo of yourself or your technician on site carrying it out. It's very, very important. A picture's worth a lot more, I think, than a thousand words here. A picture can go into a whole lot of, uh, of information. The other thing that's great is your picture will show that you've conformed to the safety standards of your site. Very simple. Guy had a hard hat on, he had, you know, his vests on, um, you know, and it shows exactly kind of what you were doing, you know, uh, on site. So data collection parameters are very, very important. Number four, results. And results. In the results section, right, so for ground penetrating, this is just where you want to lay out exactly what you found. Very simple. You don't need to go, you know, crazy. You might have a discussion section here. It might be results and discussion, or you might have a separate discussion session um, if you want, right, if that's required, if it's academic for sure. But for the results section, it's going to look something like this. In the 20 by 40 foot area that we investigated, we found 26 possible unmarked graves. Very simple. Very simple, to the point, direct. That's how I open up the results section, okay? Uh, 26 possible unmarked graves. You know, you might say 14 of them are highly probable, while the rest are, uh, are, are, are speculative. Um, you know, figure six shows an example of, you know, one of the probable graves. It conforms to the response from a mark grave just off of our uh, uh, grid. So you have that comparison. You know, that's how I go about res uh, result sections. For concrete scanning, for example, you might say, you know, for all 26, we found um, sufficient space within each of the two foot by two foot grids for a core to drill through without hitting rebar, uh, you know, without hit hitting rebar, um, a core size that might be six inches. I don't know, whatever, whatever it is, but something really specific, really specific. You know, in 10 of these, we found sufficient space for a six inch drill to go through, and six of them we found you know, sufficient space for a two and a half inch drill to go through. I don't know. But that's an example. It's really direct. It's very clear. And then what you would do in that case is you'd give pictures of your markouts. Um, maybe you do it one or two as samples, or you do all of them if you're doing an extended report. Uh, uh, and then showing where maybe in there, you know, a six inch or a two and a half inch might fit through. So that's results. Five, which is the final section, is conclusion. Okay. And so in the conclusion, or conclusions, right, either one, you could say conclusion or conclusions, put that in these parentheses, uh, you wrap it up, you summarize, you know, what, what, what already happened, and you give, this is most important, you give your recommendations. So, uh, um, you know, what further work needs to be done, what other techniques might they want to use to enhance what you already do with the GPR, um, we find that it's okay to go ahead and refurbish because in the area you know, of this 20 by 40 meter grid, you know, the area that's going to be refurbished is sufficiently far enough away from any potential unmarked graves. Something like that. That would be, you know, a recommendation comes in the conclusion uh, or in the conclusions section. So I hope this was helpful to you. If you've been writing reports and you're a little confused about how to do it, this is a good framework. This works for one page. This works for 40 pages. You could add other sections in there. You could add, you know, um, settings, right, as its own section, okay? You could add background, ground, as its own section, okay? Um, you know, there's a variety of things you can do. Results, you could add a discussion as its own section. You could add an appendix which has all of the data you collected, right? You could have a long appendix and a short report, you know, of actual text. Uh, um, if they want all the information, you know, I try not to put all of the data right in the middle of a report. Um, so you might want to add an appendix or a couple appendixes or appendices at the end. But this is a framework. This framework works. It's a good one to follow, and you'll become more and more efficient as you begin to follow uh, uh, this, these, these, these five sections. If you haven't done so, please grab a copy of our book, GPR Basics, okay? We go over a whole lot in here, um, but it's really readable. Uh, we go over each of these sections in there in a little bit more detail, plus talk about how do you document before you even get to report writing. Um, 
plus the benefits and limitations, things that might go into a report. Uh, setting out the limits of a particular site, very important, you know, also think, uh, uh, something that can go into a report. So please grab your copy. If you liked the video and found it helpful, then share it around and subscribe to the video, okay? Uh, subscribe to the channel and like the video. Um, put in the comments below a section that I don't have that you think is required. If you think that I missed something, tell me. People love telling me what I missed, so I welcome it. Put in the section, you know, in the comments below something that I missed. And even if you felt like I missed something, subscribe to the channel or go over to learngpr.com, put your name and email address in. We'll send these to your inbox every single week. And you'll also get our free uh, video. It's about 40 minutes long introduction to ground penetrating radar. If you talked about anything that you don't understand, it's a great way to begin your education. So thank you so much. I always appreciate uh, 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 you watching and I wish you nothing but the best.